Welcome to Monday Matinee on the Mutual Audio Network, hosted by Pete Lutz. The following audio drama is rated PG-13, suggesting that all children under the age of 13 should listen accompanied by an adult. Hi there, and welcome to Sonic Society Season 12, Episode 511. I'm Jack Ward. And I'm David Alt, and we're your hosts of the largest showcase of modern audio theatre. Indeed we are. Tonight, we complete Part 2 of Leap Audio, a Narada Radio Theatre's adaptation of the incredible stage play 8, based on the Proposition 8 groundbreaking court battle over marriage equality. Mm. And yes, Jack Ward is Brad Pitt. <laughs> and it happens... <laughs> and it happens right here. <laughs> if only I had his hair. On the Sonic Society. (laughs) I'm willing to acknowledge that there are plenty of good Californians that voted for Proposition 8 because they are not, well, let's say they are uncomfortable with gay people. They are uncomfortable with gay people entering into marriage. And they are uncomfortable with the very idea that gay people are just like us. But they didn't hear. And too bad they couldn't have seen the evidence in this trial. The Supreme Court has said that marriage is the most important relation in life. It is the foundation of society. It is essential to the orderly pursuit of happiness. It is a right of privacy older than the Bill of Rights and older than all of our political parties, a right of intimacy to the degree of being sacred. There are 14 Supreme Court decisions that talk about the right of marriage and the testimony of all these expert witnesses and the testimony of the plaintiffs. That erects an insurmountable barrier to the proponents of this proposition. It will not hurt Californians. It will benefit Californians. But as long as it doesn't hurt Californians to get rid of a harmful stigma in their constitution that's labeling people into classes, then it's unconstitutional. Thank you, Your Honor. Very well. Thank you, Mr. Olson. We have come to lunchtime, and Mr. Cooper, you are up at one, and I look forward to hearing from you at that time. It's not discrimination. It's not discrimination to treat different things differently. I have a message for our good friends who don't agree with us. The 52% of Californians who came together across the lines of race and creed and color to protect marriage as the union of husband and wife are not haters. There is a rather powerful evidence that human beings are a two-sex species designed for sexual rather than asexual reproduction. If this is true, then the absence of desire for the opposite sex represents, at a minimum, a sexual dysfunction. Spencer, aren't you hungry? Uh, no, not really. I can't miss practice again and still start on Friday. Yeah, I have a test. Three tests, actually. (sighs) How long do we have to be here? At its deepest level, this thing called marriage stands for the reality that our bodies have meaning. That it's not an accident that we are born male and female. That the deepest yearnings of our hearts and even our bodies have a purpose. A baby, as you know, is God's opinion that the world should go on. It is not a creature of government, something invented and reinvented for the latest fad. But, I mean, they're not really doing anything in there. They're just providing lots and lots of dense evidence. I mean, I just hear it and I'm like, uh, okay. Who cares? You know, I thought it was interesting, personally. But their side, they're just, they're so... 
Subpar, Spencer. Subpar, that's the perfect word. Thank you, Elliot. And it's nothing we don't know already. So why are we here? What are activist judges proposing to do? To redefine what the word husband means. To redefine what the word wife means. To redefine what the word parent means. So that no longer has these deep roots in the natural order. Hey, we'll get tapas at Fonda's on our way home. How about that? Whatever. We'll just get takeout and walk home. Oh, your mom's, huh? It's that special kind of torture to be like at a restaurant with your mom's, right? It's not that bad. I think you're interesting, Sandy. <laughs> God. <laughs> just one more night and we'll be back to normal. And you'll be really, really bored again. I promise. <laughs> So what is this thing called same-sex marriage? I'll tell you what it is. It amounts to a vast social experiment on children. And rewriting the basic rules of marriage puts all children, not just the children in unisex unions, at risk. And that's the real truth. Thank you very much. Mr. Cooper, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Your Honor. The New York Court of Appeals observed in 2006 that, until quite recently, it was an accepted truth for almost everyone who lived in a society in which marriage existed that there could be marriages only between participants of different sex. So the first question is, why has marriage been so universally defined by virtually all societies at all times in human history as an exclusively opposite sex institution? It is because marriage serves a societal purpose that is equally ubiquitous, a purpose that makes marriage fundamental to the very existence and survival of the human race. And the historical record leaves no doubt that the central purpose of marriage in virtually all societies and at all times has been to channel potentially procreative sexual relations into enduring, stable unions to increase the likelihood that any offspring will be raised by a man and woman who brought them into the world. Mr. Olson often quotes the Supreme Court's statement that marriage creates the most important relation in life. That quote comes from the Maynard case, and the Maynard Court explained why the institution of marriage is uniquely imbued with public interest. Do people get married to benefit the community? Your Honor? When one enters into a marriage, you don't say, Oh boy, I'm going to be able to benefit society by getting married. What you think of is, I'm going to get a life partner. Yes, Your Honor. Somebody that I can share my life with, maybe have children. But all sorts of things come out of a marriage. Yeah, but if you... But is this purpose of marriage for individuals to benefit society? Well, it may well be that individuals who get married aren't doing it in order to benefit the community, although that is the ultimate result of it. But the question has to be, wh well, why does the government regulate this relationship? Why? That's a good question. Why doesn't it leave it entirely up to private contract? It is because this relationship is crucial to the public interest because, Your Honor, this procreative sexual relation is an enormous benefit to society, and it represents a very real threat to society's interests. A threat? A threat. A threat in the sense that to whatever extent children are born into the world without this stable, enduring marital unit and raised by both of the parents that brought them into this world, then a host of very, very negative social implications arise. But the state doesn't withhold the right to marriage to people who are unable to produce children of their own. Are you suggesting that the state should? No. No. S Your Honor, no. It, it, it is by no means a necessary... Uh, a necessary condition or a necessary requirement... Well, then the state must have some interest wholly apart from procreation. Your Honor, it isn't a necessary requirement that the state actually insists that individuals who get married have children or be able to have children. How... how would it go about administering such a requirement? It would be... we'd have to... we'd have to have a pre... premarital fertility testing, some kind of premarital pledge in which the couple found to be fertile, some kind of intrusive process, also pledged to actually have children. Your Honor, these... These kinds of Orwellian... Orwellian... It is Orwellian. 
But isn't that the logic that flows from the premise that marriage is about procreation? It is enough if the state or the society seeks to attempt to ensure and increase the likelihood. Really, that's what it boils down to. Increase the likelihood that naturally procreative sexual relationships will take place in an enduring and stable family environment for the sake of raising children. Isn't the state indifferent with respect to how the child was conceived? The state and every state and every society for the millennia, Your Honor, has attempted to channel naturally procreative sexual conduct between men and women into an enduring stable union for the sake of... Let's move on from the millennia to the three weeks in January when we had the trial. What does the evidence show? Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. I... I believe the evidence shows overwhelmingly that this interest in what many call, and the United States Congress calls, responsible procreation, is really at the heart of society's interest in regulating marriage. Okay. Because, for example, what the evidence shows it is that eminent... I'm just... What was the witness who offered the testimony? What was it and so forth? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, sociologist Kingsley Davis has described the universal societal interest in marriage as recognition and approval of a couple engaging in sexual intercourse and marrying and rearing offspring. Blackstone, Your Honor, said that there are two great relations in private life. First, that of husband and wife. I don't mean to be flip, but Blackstone didn't testify. Kingsley Davis didn't testify. What testimony in this case supports the proposition? But, Your Honor, you don't have to have evidence for this from these authorities. This is, this is in the cases themselves. I don't have to have evidence? You don't. You don't have to have evidence of the... of this point if one court after another... Your Honor, most courts, most of the courts, at least two-thirds, Your Honor, or just approximately anyway, two-thirds of all the judges that have looked at this issue before you have, have upheld the traditional, or would have, would have, up, would have upheld this traditional definition of marriage on this rationale. This, this rationale. And the plaintiffs say there is no way to understand why anyone would support Proposition 8 except through some irrational dark motivation, some animus, some, some kind of bigotry. Your Honor, that is just not only a slur on 7 million Californians who supported Proposition 8, it is a slur on 70 out of 108 judges who Let have... me ask. If you have got 7 million Californians who took this position, 70 judges, as you pointed out, and this long history that you have described... Why, in this case, did you present but one witness on this subject? One witness. And I think it fair to say his testimony was equivocal in some respects. The defense on this case started with a long list of witnesses. But you see, it's, it's easy for people who want to deprive gay and lesbians of their right to make all kinds of statements in campaign literature or on TV where they can't be cross-examined. But when they have to come into court... <laughs> And defend those opinions under oath? Well, I mean, initial depositions. Their expert witnesses started having second thoughts. That included Dr. William Tam, one of the very men who worked to put Proposition 8 on the ballot in the first place. What is your relationship to the traditional family coalition? I am the executive director of the traditional family coalition. All right. This is an email that you wrote on May 15th, 2008. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. Yes. And the last sentence of this says, We can't lose the battle for Proposition 8 or God's definition of marriage will be permanently erased in California. Now, was that your motivation for participating with ProtectMarriage.com and promoting Proposition 8? Mm. The other reason is... I think it's very important that our children not grow up to fantasize or thinking about should I marry Jane or John when I grow up. Then you go on to say, what will be next? On their agenda list is legalizing having sex with children. And this was something that you were putting out in order to convince people to vote for Proposition 8. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. And then the last sentence says, if sexual orientation is characterized as a civil right, then so would pedophilia, polygamy, and incest. Do you agree with that, sir? Yes, I agree. 
And that's what you were telling people in order to convince them to vote for Proposition 8. Is, is that correct? Yes. Let me go down to point four, where you say that countries that legalized same-sex marriage saw alarming moral decline. You believe that after the Netherlands legalized same-sex marriage, the Netherlands went on after that to legalize incest and polygamy. And uh, who told you that, sir? It's in the internet. In the internet? And you just put it out there to convince voters to vote for Proposition 8? Yeah. After his deposition, Dr. Tam chose to avoid the subpoenas compelling him to appear in court under oath. In effect, Dr. Tam went on the lam, refusing to testify, and after our depositions of their potential witnesses were complete, only two, uh, two, were still willing to testify. Their only remaining expert on marriage was a Mr. Blankenhorn. Raise your right hand, please. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Mr. Blankenhorn, what is the primary purpose of marriage in human groups? We're embodied as male and female. That's the basic division in the species. We, we reproduce sexually. In fact, the famous anthropologist Claude Levi Strauss once described marriage as a social institution with a biological foundation. He was saying that across societies, that the man and the woman, whose sexual union makes the child, that those same two individuals are also the social and legal parents of the child. And there is only one institution in the world that performs the task of bringing together the three dimensions of parenthood, the biological, the social, and the legal. That institution is marriage, because we know how important this is for children. Very well. Mr. Boys, you may cross-examine. All right. Um, let me try to make this as simple as I can. Have any of the, the, any of the scholars that you said you relied on said that permitting same-sex marriage would cause a reduction in heterosexual marriage? That's yes, no, or I don't know. Well, I know the answer. <laughs> I cannot answer you correctly if the only words I'm allowed to choose from is yes or no. I can give you my answer in a very brief sentence. If you know the answer, why don't you share it with us? Uh, well, I would be happy to, but he's only permitting me to give yes and no, and I, I cannot do that and be accurate. He is giving you three choices. Yes, no, I don't know. But I do know. I do know the answer. Then is it yes or is it no? Your, your Honor, I can answer the question, but I cannot give an accurate answer if the only two choices I have are yes and no. I, if you'll give me a sentence, I can answer this in one sentence is all I'm asking for. All right. Let's take a sentence. One sentence. Can you ask me the question again, please? Yes. Have any of the scholars who you say you relied on asserted that they believe permitting same-sex marriage will result in a reduction in the heterosexual marriage rate? My answer is that I believe that some of the scholars I have cited have asserted that permitting same-sex marriage would contribute to the deinstitutionalization of marriage, one of the manif manifestations of which would be a lower marriage rate among heterosexuals. But I do not have the knowledge that, in the, in the exact form of words you are asking me for, they have made the direct assertion that permitting same-sex marriage would directly lower the marriage rate among heterosexuals. Mr. Blankenhorn. That wasn't long. Questions and answers. If I were to take that as an I don't know, would that be fair? Well, with respect, Your Honor, I would disagree with you. I know exactly my answer to this question, and I have just stated it. And I would be happy to restate it. The record is clear on what you said, Your Honor, if you will. 
I want to address the issue of whether or not there is a legitimate basis for people to be concerned that redefining the traditional understanding of marriage presents any basis for concern about the harm that may result. But before analyzing this, I think we have to begin with two propositions. The first one is that redefining the institution will change the institution. And I think Mr. Blankenhorn really summed it up quite well. It's impossible to be completely sure about a prediction of future events, but I do have a great deal of confidence in the likelihood of the weakening of marriage through the process of deinstitutionalization to a greater degree than would be the case otherwise. If you change the definition of the thing, it's hard to imagine how it could have no impact on the thing. So while I don't think anyone here can say that they know from a scientific study that they, that they know with absolute certainty that this will happen, I sincerely believe that this is the most, this, this is a likely outcome, a likely result of adopting same-sex marriage. And when you say, based on the scholars that have studied this, that's because you're simply repeating the things that these scholars say. You, you're just a transmitter of the findings of these scholars. Is that correct? Now, you're, you're putting words in my mouth now. No, sir. Yes, sir. I was simply trying to report the view of some scholars that I was basing my arguments on. I'm saying that there are scholars, respected scholars, who have made this argument based on ethnographic research, and I've read them, and that's the basis for my assertion. That's all. Your Honor, could I ask this witness be instructed to listen to the question, answer my question, and not make a statement that is responsive to the question, even if he believes it's important? I don't need such instruction. That's what... that uh, my, my intention is to do exactly that. Mr. Blankenhorn, one of the instructions that the court gives to the jury when an expert witness testifies is to consider the witness's background, training, and all of the other evidence in the case. And that other evidence includes the demeanor of the witness. So, I would urge you to pay close attention to Mr. Boy's questions and to answer them directly, succinctly. So bear that in mind. Yes, sir, I will. I'm really just addressing whether I was putting words in your mouth. Uh, if you look at page 300, lines 7 through 12, you said that you are basing your analysis on the work of highly regarded scholars, and then you said... Okay, ha, a gotcha moment. I, I used the word, I'm a transmitter of findings of eminent scholars. Gotcha, okay, okay. No, that's not a gotcha. I'm just trying to. Okay, I said transmitter seven months ago in a deposition. And what you meant there was that you weren't making these conclusions on your own. You were simply repeating what these scholars had to say. Is that correct? If I may say so in my own words, well, I was basing... Well, let me, uh, let me, uh, look at your words. Page 300. I am simply repeating things that they say. I can assure you these are not my own conclusions. I am, I'm, I'm a transmitter here of findings, of, of findings of these eminent scholars. Did you give that testimony at your deposition? That's what I said at the deposition. Your Honor, you will not find anywhere in the pages of history, nowhere, any suggestion that the traditional definition of marriage across cultures, across time, had anything whatever to do with homosexuality, had nothing to do with it. You heard Mr. Olson this morning recount the background of the Loving decision by the Supreme Court in 1967, and up to that time numerous states had laws in the books which prohibited interracial marriage. Why are we not at that same tipping point here with respect to same-sex marriage? Your Honor, several reasons. Among the most important is this. What legitimate purpose of marriage, recognized historically or anywhere else, provided a rational basis for the state of Virginia to say that an interracial couple could not get married? It certainly wasn't core procreative purpose. Excuse me for interrupting. But you recall the rationale that was used by the courts was that the mixing of the races would have serious corrosive effects on society. Your Honor, those racist, racist sentiments and policies had no foundation in the historical purpose of marriage. And in fact, they actually made people have illegitimate children, illegitimate natural children, which again was the perp. 
The purpose of marriage, as Justice Stevens says, is to license cohabitation and produce legitimate children. As the Eighth Circuit Court said, Your Honor, only opposite-sex couples can procreate naturally, and therefore, it is only opposite-sex couples who uniquely address this fundamental historic... But you don't draw any distinction between the state's interest where an opposite-sex couple have had to require some form of intervention in order to produce children. The state's interest is exactly the same, is it not? Your Honor, not. They are not quite the same, no. Well, then, what's the difference? I really think the state's main concern, or certainly among the state's main concerns in regulating marriage and in seeking to channel naturally procreative sexual conduct into stable and enduring unions is to minimize what I call irresponsible procreation. It's not a good term, but I can't think of a more serviceable one and that is procreation that isn't bound by social norms and that often leads to children being raised by one parent or the other, or sometimes neither parent. And my point was that there are a number of heterosexual couples who do not naturally procreate, who require the intervention of some third party or some medical assistance of some kind. Yes, Your Honor, and it is not those opposite-sex couples either that the state is concerned about in terms of the threats to society and the concerns that society has from irresponsible procreation. Why don't those same values you have described apply to lesbian couples and gay couples coming together, supporting one another, providing love, comfort, and support for one another? Why don't all of those considerations apply just as much to the plaintiffs here as they apply to John and Jane Doe? Your Honor, Your Honor, I, I, I want to conclude this piece of my argument by calling the Court's attention to a case from the 11th Circuit called Lofton. It was a case in which the 11th Circuit upheld a Florida statute that prohibited gay adoptions. Taking all of this available information into account, the legislature could rationally conclude that a family environment with married opposite-sex parents remains the optimum social structure in which to bear children, and that the raising of children by same-sex couples presents an alternative structure for child-rearing that has not yet proven itself to be as optimal as the biologically-based marriage norm. I'd like to ask you something. Why should Mr. Blankenhorn's testimony be admitted? Does he meet the Daubert standards? His professional life for 20 years has been devoted to the study of one subject, the subject of marriage. He's written two books on this subject matter. Were they peer-reviewed? I think the Ninth Circuit's standards for qualifying an expert are particularly liberal, and I don't think they require... They certainly don't insist that an expert's publications have been peer-reviewed. So, Your Honor, again, I... 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 I really didn't come... All right here to particularly re-argue that, but I do believe I, I, I will, I, 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 will the court entertain, uh, well, a break? Uh, maybe five minutes. Why don't we take a little more than that and resume at ten minutes after the hour? What did that mean? What? Irresponsible procreation? Illegitimate, natural children? What is he talking about in there? They're going to say whatever they have to. It doesn't mean it's true or that it's about you. You two certainly weren't accidents. God knows. So he was talking about us, me and Elliot, specifically, to our faces? Spencer, it's, it's not... Technically, his back was to us, Spence. He didn't even say it to our faces. When I was 21 and she was 19, my sister was diagnosed with inoperable brain cancer. The summer I graduated from college, she died. I was the only biological child my parents had left. Losing Karen changed us all, not necessarily for the best. We all fumbled through the sadness for years after that. It really felt like we'd been devastated and broken forever. My 20s were so wrapped up in grieving and healing, but I eventually came out of it. And when I did, I felt crystal clear that I wanted a family. I wanted to give birth. I wanted to feel connected to my kids the way I had to my parents and Karen when she was alive. I was unequivocal in my desire to have kids and bring the best parts of my sister, our family, 
and our future together. The rest is pretty typical. My partner of seven years and I started the process of learning how to get pregnant. Yes, lesbians have to learn how. I went to a Considering Parenthood class for lesbians. We chose a donor. We started inseminating. And after a year and a half, I decided to use fertility medication, and that's when it worked. I got pregnant in the spring of 1994. I was eight months pregnant on my 30th birthday and bigger than our little house. You boys were born at UCSF on October 30th by C-section. I will not give you the OR details, but you were not accidents. You were not irresponsible. You two are about the most responsible, important, meaningful things I will ever do in my whole life. And don't you ever let anyone make you feel any different. You got it? Yes, yes Mom. Mom. But we still don't want to eat out tonight. Fine. Tacos, takeout, whatever you want. Hey, it's our turn. If you want to hear the rest, we should go back in. Come on. Now, you believe that gays and lesbians today are raising children, correct? Of course, yes. And, in fact, hundreds of thousands of children are being raised by gay and lesbian couples. Is that correct? I don't know how many. Did you ever try to find out? I did. And were you able to make an approximation? I was. Yes, sir, I was. And what was the approximation? I can't recall. Can you recall approximately? No, sir. Okay, and you recognize that in some cases, gays and lesbians are raising a child that is the biological child of one of the parents, and in some cases, they are raising adopted children. That's correct? Those would be two two of... Yeah, of course they would be. Those would be examples of, those would be examples of children in gay and lesbian homes. Yes, and you believe that permitting gay and lesbian couples to marry would significantly advantage the gay and lesbians themselves and the children that they are raising. Is that correct, sir? When you say advantage, do you mean improve the well-being of? Yes. My answer to your question is that. I believe that adopting same-sex marriage would be likely to Im- improve the well-being of gay and lesbian households and their children. In fact, the studies show that all things being equal, two adoptive parents raising a child from birth will do as well as two biological parents raising a child from birth, correct? No, sir, that's incorrect. Well, sir? May I say another word on that, please? You will have an opportunity to redirect. The studies show that adoptive parents, um, because of the rigorous screening process that they undertake before becoming adoptive parents, actually on some outcomes, outstrip the biological parents in terms of providing protective care for their children. Yes, I was going to come to that. I appreciate you for getting me there. In binder number one, we have a copy of your book, Future of Marriage, and the last two sentences. After all, part of the reason why the principle is so revolutionary is that it can grow and deepen over time. Groups that have long been considered effectively outside its moral reach, African Americans, women, people of certain colors or languages or religions, can over time and often as a result of great struggle, enter into its protective sphere. And then you get into two sentences I want to particularly direct your attention to. You say, I believe that today the principle of equal human dignity must apply to gay and lesbian persons. Do you see that? Yes. Yes, sir. And the I there is you, correct? Uh, uh, That's correct. And you say that. In that sense, insofar as we as a nation founded on this principle, we would be more, emphasize, more American on the day we permit same-sex marriage than when we were on the day before. And you wrote those words. Did you not, sir? I wrote those words. And you believe them to be correct? Yes. Yes, I now believe them. That's correct. Your Honor, I have no more questions. When they came into court, and they have to support and defend their opinions under oath and cross-examination, those opinions just melt away. There simply wasn't any evidence. There weren't any empirical studies. It's made up. It's junk science. 
And it's easy to say that on television. But the witness stand is a lonely place to lie. And when you come into court, you can't do that. And that's what we did. We put fear and prejudice on trial. Your Honor, Mr. Blankenhorn's testimony was utterly unnecessary for this proposition. Utterly unnecessary for this proposition. This goes back to the you don't need any evidence point. Mr. Cooper, carry on. The plaintiffs think that the consequences dominantly will be good consequences. But it's not something that they can possibly prove. And we would submit to you, because I have heard this and read this more than any three words that I have ever spoken, I don't know. I don't know how many times I wish I could have taken those words back. Well, because, Your Honor, whatever your question is, I damn sure know there's a risk. And we want to see what happens in Massachusetts. We want to see what happens right here and elsewhere. But the I don't know or we don't know where it's going to lead answer, is that enough to impose upon some citizens a restriction that others do not suffer from? We don't have to prove that redefining marriage to include same-sex marriage would visit harm upon the institution and the interest that it serves. Rather, we only have to prove that including same-sex couples would not serve those interests. The California Court of Appeals actually upheld the traditional definition of marriage, and one of the points it made, Your Honor, really goes to the heart of the matter. It is the proper role of the legislature, not the court, to fashion laws that serve competing public policies. There is a debate about the morals and the practicalities and the wisdom of this issue that really goes to the nature of our culture, and the Constitution should allow that debate to go forward among the people. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. Mr. Olson, why don't we just begin at that point that Mr. Cooper just left off with? And that is, in a sense, isn't that the danger, not that you're going to lose this case, either here or at the Court of Appeals or at the Supreme Court, but that you might just win it? Well, I think the case you're referring to has to do with abortion, Your Honor. It does indeed. Your Honor, the cases upon which we rely have been entirely different cases. They have relied on fundamental, established constitutional law. Because the argument that Mr. Cooper made is essentially the same argument that was made in the Loving Court, which, by the way, the Loving Court unanimously decided to strike down. And we stand here today thinking, how could that have been? In 1967, that's only 40 or so years ago, we would have punished as a felon in the state of Virginia the president's own mother and father if they tried to travel there and be married. Now, Mr. Cooper's argument is, and I know why he would like to take back these words, we don't know. We don't have to prove anything. We don't have any evidence. Yet he was reading from articles written by various persons who did not come into this courtroom and testify under oath and subject themselves to cross-examination by my colleague, Mr. Boyce. Some of them didn't come into court because they have been cross-examined by Mr. Boyce in their depositions. But you do have to know. He does have to prove. The Romer Court specifically says, Under the lowest standard of review, you have to prove that you have a legitimate interest and that the subject, Proposition 8 in this case, advances that legitimate interest. So, How does preventing same-sex couples from getting married advance the interest of procreation? What one single bit of information is there that they are a threat to the channeling function? If you accept that California has the right in the first place, and I do not, I believe, Your Honor, that there is a political tide turning. I think that people's eyes are being opened finally. People are becoming more understanding and tolerant. The polls tell us that. There isn't any secret in that. But that does not justify a judge in a court to say, I really need the polls to be just a few inches higher. I need someone to go out and take the temperature of the American public before I can break this barrier and break down this discrimination. 
Because if they change it here in the next election in California, we still have Utah, we still have Missouri, and we still have Montana. This case is going to go to a court. Some judge is going to have to decide what we've asked you to decide. And you have to have a reason, Your Honor. And you have to have a reason that's real. Not speculation. Not built on stereotypes. And not hypothetical. That's what the Supreme Court decision tells us. And I submit, at the end of the day, I don't know, and I don't have to put on any evidence, with all due respect to Mr. Cooper, does not cut it. It does not cut it when you're taking away the constitutional rights, basic human rights, and human decency from a large group of individuals. You cannot say after the fact, we are going to take away the constitutional right to liberty, privacy, association, and sexual intimacy that we already tell you you have. That is not acceptable. And it's not acceptable under our Constitution. And Mr. Blankenhorn is absolutely right. The day we end that, we will be more American. Thank you. So, if there's nothing further, Mr. Cooper? Nothing. Very well, the matter is submitted. Now what? I know, I know, it's too late for soccer, but we're gonna go home. We'll just pick up food on the way and you can study for your tests. And what, we're just supposed to wait? Yeah, how long do we have to wait? I'm not sure, Elliot. Why not? You've got all these lawyers and people in suits running around. I mean, someone's got to at least have an approximation of how long we have to wait. I mean, give me a break. Come on. We'll fight these guys another day. You've got soccer practice tomorrow. You've got tests to study for. Fine. 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 Mom? What? What is it? This whole thing was just ignorant. I hated being here. You're right. You're right. You shouldn't have had to be here. It's my fault, okay? I'm really sorry, Elliot. I am. I'm just... Let's just get out of here, okay? No. I just... I just remember when you were up there and looking around and seeing everyone crying around me and not even realizing myself, but I was crying too. I mean, I just saw my mom up there fighting for us, and I'm glad to hear it. I am. I just hated that we had to. I know. That's all. I'm proud of you. I guess that's what I'm saying. I love you, Mom. I love you too, honey. On August 4th, 2010, Federal Judge Walker ruled unequivocally that California's gay marriage ban, Proposition 8, is unconstitutional. And on February 7th, 2012, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals affirmed that decision. It was a momentous victory for gay rights supporters, but it was not the end of the fight. It was the beginning of what promises to be a longer struggle and one destined for this country's highest court. Judge Walker's decision was stayed, pending decisions by higher courts. So tonight, like millions of other Americans, Jeff Zirillo and Paul Katami, Sandy Steer and Chris Perry still cannot be legally wed. Their family still unrecognized and unprotected in the country they love. I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. The first time somebody said to me, are you married? And I said, yes. I would think, that feels good and honest and true. I would feel less like I had to protect my kids or worry that they feel any shame or sense of not belonging. I shouldn't have to feel ashamed. Being gay doesn't make me any less American. It doesn't change my patriotism. It doesn't change the fact that I pay my taxes and I own a home and I want to start a family. I would be able to stand alongside my parents 
my brother, and his wife, to be able to stand together as one family who have all had the opportunity of being married, and the pride that one feels when that happens. If Prop 8 were undone, and kids like me, growing up in Bakersfield right now, could never have to know what this felt like, their entire lives would be on a higher arc. They would live with a higher sense of themselves that would improve the quality of their entire life. And that's what I hope is the outcome of this case. I hope for something for Chris and I, but other people, over time, would benefit in an even more profound, life-changing way. That's what I hope for. You have been listening to Eight, a play about the fight for marriage equality by Dustin Lance Black. Featured in the cast were Austin Beach as Charles Cooper, Bob Carroll as Evan Wolfson, Shannon Grace as Maggie Gallagher, Christian Ferris as David Blankenhorn, MJ Cogburn as Dr. Cott, Jeremy Hennessy as Dr. Gregory Herrick, Michael Cogburn as Elliot Perry, Mason Cogburn as Spencer Perry, John Washington as Dr. Tam, Kian Lutz as Ryan Kendall, Christy Glick as Sandy Steer, Melody Gaines as Chris Perry, Kyle Bauer as Dr. Island Meyer, Morris Curran as Jeff Cirillo, Omar Lopez as Paul Katami, Lisa Marie Ayala as the court clerk, Victoria Flansky as the journalist, with special guest stars Pete Lutz as Judge Vaughn Walker, Jack Ward as David Boyce, Tim Gillick as Dr. Gary Segura, and Mark Brzee as Theodore Olson, with Nick Womack as the narrator. This play was written by Dustin Lance Black, produced by Pete Lutz for 63 Audio and Mark Brzee for Leap Audio. Post-production by Mark Brzee. Line direction by Pete Lutz. Love Don't Know a Reason by Michael Callan was used without permission. Eight was originally funded by the American Foundation for Equal Rights and Broadway Impact. This has been a co-production of 63 Audio and Leap Audio. Thank you for listening. And that's this week's show. Thanks so much to Narada Radio Theatre and Leap Audio for this feature. Now, please remember to consider your participation in this summer's Sonic Summerstock Playhouse of Old Time Radio Goodness, produced by some of your favourite new time audio production companies. Find us at sonicsociety.org, Twitter, the Facebook groups, audio drama, radio drama lovers, Sonic Society, etc. And of course, look for more new shows and exciting news of new releases from EVP at evicuna.com. And so, I'm David. Alt. And I'm Jack Ward. Good night. Good night. The Sonic Society is written and produced weekly by Jack J. Ward and David Alt, with original music by Sharon B. at SharonB.com. All features, interviews, and audio drama shorts are owned completely by their originators and provided to the Sonic Society by Creative Commons Licensing. The Society itself originates from Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. Thanks for listening. This has been an Electric Vicuna production. Monday Matinee on the Mutual Audio Network always means a potpourri of entertainment, drama, comedy, action. Whew, it really stimulates the mind, don't it? Well, a great way to get your mind back into neutral gear is to catch Bells in the Battery on Friday Follies and Sunday Showcase. Silliness is the best cure for mental stimulation. Bells in the Battery. Always odd, always family-friendly. If only I could convince my family to listen to it. (laughs) 